then, uh, you know, we're related but different, but uh, women in sales. Uh, what, what are some of your thoughts there? We need more of them. <laughs> um, we all know the numbers say that women tend to, to achieve quota more consistently. And I think that something we should just be able to love is how can we uh, foster more women in sales? I know something that's near and dear to your heart as well is um, you got to start at the, the bottom or the top, however you want to say it, um, early in their career. Let's go that way. Um, yeah. So in previous lives, what I'd always focused on was building um, a really strong uh, women pipeline, so to speak, in my SDR orgs. Um, and then making sure they had good mentorship and um, conversations with other women in sales so they could see themselves um, in those roles, those quota carrying roles uh, outside of SDR. Yeah. And then what about going back with something we talked about before? But yeah, I'm always amazed. I mean, there's really not that different topics, but that there's not that many colleges that actually have you know sales programs, but at least for those that do, um, you know. The, the time to start, I mean, you have kind of however many people you have in, in the, you know, how many women you have in sales are what they are there. But then you kind of, how do you go back to these colleges? Ones that have sales programs are great, but then even ones that don't and say, okay, this is a viable field. I mean, how many people are, at, you know, liberal, you know, we're at liberal arts. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. they have sales and they thought there's no way in hell I'm going to do that. So kind of, I would think going back proactively somehow and really kind of educating and not that you're grabbing, but just kind of showing the light. Absolutely. That was early on. I mean, I definitely was in school at a point where we did not have a, a sales degree or, or anything of that nature. Um, but I was in a comm school, a communication school. And I think a lot of the, the basics that were taught there are 100% still applicable to, to what selling is today. And so just taking that lens, broadening that lens a little bit, say, okay, well, where could we be recruiting from? Where yeah. should we be having conversations? Um because I think that's, if you were looking for just sales degrees, that'd be very finite. Yeah. Does UT have a sales program? I don't know if they do now, oh. um, but I was in the corporate right. communication school and yeah. it, it seemed pretty similar. Yeah. Well, that, that's great. And then um, what's, you know, any kind of special mentoring that you've gotten uh, along the way that you can think of? Yes, absolutely. So um, I think I got really lucky early on in my career. Um, uh, if you know, do you know, Matt Cameron, he's pretty prominent in the, the I, I know the name, team. but okay. He was my, uh, my manager back at Yammer. So this is, you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago. Is it that long ago? Regardless. Um, he, he stayed near and dear to me and has since then created his own, uh, community around different trainings you can take throughout your sales career. And so, um, I've been lucky enough to have him as part of my, my mentorship um, throughout the years and it's it evolves, right? It's not a consistent type of mentorship or relationship, but it's always nice to have someone that you can call and, and run a tough scenario or a tough problem through. And so if folks don't have someone like that, it's always something I encourage you to, to, to reach into your network and, and try to find, to have those sounding boards because it's been so critical to different points in my career. Yeah. And uh, I always have to watch what I say. So not, not to stereotype, but I also think sales is a great career, you know, for those that are going to be you know, r raising children because you're, you know, these days, especially you don't necessarily need to be in the office. You can have, you know, better life balance. So if you think about, you know, d different careers that are out there, you know, you'd think it's, you know, in terms of, you know, work-life balance, you know, sales really offers, you know, probably one of, one of the better opportunities for that. Sure. It definitely affords you to have more command over your calendar um, yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's been really wonderful. Um, I, I have a 14-month-old at home, and like we shared earlier, and it's been great to be able to run him to and from daycare, things of that nature. And so as long as you are able to keep that command of your calendar, um, yeah. it's a wonderful way to, to have that balance, too. Yeah. And I guess also, too, I guess whether you're mother or father or whatever, however you identify that you know, with the whole Zoom technology, it's probably just broader topic on just parenting overall has probably helped, you know, uh, a lot of us you know, be home more. And a lot of times, say, instead of doing that, you know, flight or be gone Monday to Friday, you know, it's, it's so good to be out there for sure. But you can be probably a lot more effective and a lot more selective. Uh, so being more productive in the workplace and then, you know, being, for lack of better words, just a better, better partner, better spouse. 
Absolutely. The ability to be, to be more present literally um, yeah. has, has been wonderful. But then on the flip side, you do sometimes get cameos from, you know, little people you don't always want in your videos. Yeah, but that's just so authentic. I think like if you know, walk by right now, I think that's so cute, right? Or you got dogs yeah. or whatever. I mean, it just shows that you're, especially, I think the higher up you go from an executive perspective, I mean, it just shows that people, you know, people are people, yeah. right? It's like, exactly. I, I exactly. love that. Yeah. He's definitely made a cameo or two on videos before where I'm like, oh, at least have a shirt on. And he wouldn't be running around without a shirt on. <laughs> That's all right. That's great. Uh, anyway, so maybe he'll come. Is he home now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. We'll have to maybe get his uh, first podcast appearance. <laughs> oh, he would love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, anyway, so moving on here. So, you know, that value selling is something that uh, as a topic on the one hand has been around for a while, but the other hand, there's probably mixed degrees in terms of how well people do that. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think of value selling? I think it's become mission critical, especially in this economy. I mean, wouldn't you agree? I'm violent agreement. Yeah. 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 And I think it's something that um, when we face these macroeconomic headwinds, um, you really have to go back to some of these basics. Right. And I think that value selling is almost should be considered part of like your basic sales process. And in good times, you can get away from it a little bit. Right. Yeah. And I think now where we are, just, you really need to be very thoughtful with how you're building your business cases and how you're, you know, engaging with your executives and you just have to stay hundred percent tied to value. Yeah. So say, for example, if you're in a elevator with the CFO, either at a customer or something that you're trying to sell to, and you have kind of 20, 30 seconds, kind of what, what are some of your sound bites you'd use with a, with your gong hat on? Absolutely. Well, First, I'd probably push the emergency button to grab more than 30 seconds. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Nobody, you know, nobody's ever said that. I like that. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, so I'm sure for one thing, Randy, you know, you talk to people day in, day out about this, is that the level of scrutiny and review we've seen over our deals has become exponential over the last six to nine months. Um, you know, a million dollar deal feels like a $30 million deal now. And so if you were afforded at that time with a CFO in an elevator or even on a quick call, um, you would just have to make sure you're really tied to the company's key strategic initiatives and how you're going to help move them forward and move them down the, down the line. Because if you're not tied to those two things right now, um, you're going to have a very hard time getting that deal through. And so I, I wouldn't want to paint in broad brushstrokes there, but that's what I would just recommend everyone do is, is it has to be something they are keenly focused on and that your solution or platform can definitively solve. Yeah, definitely. And I was, I'm, uh, I, I might say a few times I might be old school, but you know, I think it comes down to ultimately, and even of what you just said is, is right there in terms of how does that impact revenue? How does that impact their op OPEX line? Right. So if you yeah. can impact those two things and then therefore profitability, you're all in, in the CFO. And then how many times, you know, do you see technology companies have all this, I, just, I call them PowerPoints with these slides mm -hmm. <laughs> of, you know, all this gobbledygook and they are like, okay, so what? Okay. So you can do the technical speed and feed better this or that, you know, what, what are you actually really going to do to, to, to drive the business? And, you know, companies like Gong that can do a great job of articulating that are going to do well. Those that can't, you know, forget about it. Absolutely. Exactly. And the, the forget about it is scary for a lot of people selling those forget about it platforms. Totally. And then uh, you also touch on another thing, which is, um, I don't say complacency, but you know, a lot of people the past year, you know, were, you know, thought they were sales superstars because for lack of better words, kind of the fish were jumping in the boats. And then, you know, now they have to, you know, maybe work a little bit harder. And, you know, I hear a lot as you, know, you, you may as well from your uh, peers or friends, other companies, but they say, hey, you know, the economy, you know, things are delayed. And then you start talking about the deal where, you know, kind of, where are you at? Who are you talking to? What's your follow up? You know, you know, like I've been on calls with people, they don't even set the next follow up call. I'm like, okay, if you're going to wait, that just delays it two weeks. There's just so many basic mm -hmm. things that really don't get done that when things are maybe tighter economically, I mean, you just have to be on top of everything, which is not to play into the gong hand, but that's kind of talking that's about you know, expecting real time, right? Absolutely. I mean, exactly that, that laundry list of what you're going through is how I use a gong deal board to inspect my business and to make sure, you know, do we have all those basics covered? 
And until I can say yes, 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 which Gong can, of course, report back to me in a matter of a couple of seconds of review, then we can go start talking about the next strategy session or then how we're going to go execute to move this deal forward. But um, I, to your point, Randy, I was talking to a peer recently and she was just complaining about how even with her enterprise sellers, not a gong, but she's a, at a different company in this space. Um, they're having to go back to the basics around confirming, did you do next steps? Are you at power? And it's just something I think that people got a little lackadaisical with, but luckily, you know, we can inspect it with gong. Yeah. And also Mike can talk forever. Last point I'll make, but the, even like a recap, thank you note. Yeah. I get brought into deal to help. Okay. You know, send me your last recap. Thank you note. Like, well, what do you mean? Like, Oh no. Yeah. What are you like? Are you kidding me? Like, you know, maybe they, I'm old yeah. school now too, Randy, because yeah. I would also just say it's like thank people for their time and give them and you know, send that quick summary of what you spoke about. Yeah, where are you at? What's going on? The next test, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, so you yeah. know, like anyway, so it's just crazy all these things. Anyway, let's uh jump. So we have a couple things, uh, Tucker here. So from Laura, value selling, problem solving, and timing. Uh, I'd give that a thumbs up. So thank you, Laura. And uh, from Peter Brennan, thanks, Peter. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping back a subject. Totally always fine to jump back uh, uh, outside of their education path or their examples of an early career and or DNI candidates experience which stand out to you. And then uh, specifically, can you think of certain types of jobs they have held in college, responsibilities they had, clubs they were part of, et cetera? Where they built the foundation to be successful. Mm, I love that. So I would actually, Peter, I'd focus more on um, competencies and behavioral traits versus past experiences. And, and here's why. I think if you focus just on past experiences, you could, you could really go down this path of going down a profile that you typically hire for very, very quickly. Did they come from these top 10 schools in California? Did they do this in college or high school? Mm -hmm. And so if you're thinking about more about competencies, like I want someone who can really think creative and strategically or who has experience like building something from the ground up, that could be a very interesting profile for someone um, in, a, in a group that's underrepresented uh, that could then be outside of that regular profile that you're talking about in terms of college and responsibilities. I can hope you that get more so, Yeah, so before you go on, so examples of so building something from the ground up i mean practically speaking somebody younger mm -hmm. in their career probably wouldn't have done much to build something ground up right so a or woman i hired once um into into a role in a previous life was selling wholesale coffee prior to coming into tech and that sounds like that's apples and oranges couldn't get further apart right love when it. You're interviewing with her, he's yeah. like oh no i owned all of northern california I had to cold call into them and to oh, yeah. small coffee places. And then I had to go, you know, heels on the ground, go in and like teach them how to use our, our product and our services. So to me, what I was hearing was she's very entrepreneurial. She's not afraid of the phone. Um, and then she also has the wherewithal to educate someone through the customer life cycle, her customer life cycle, but at least educate through. Um, and so we hired her and she was a wonderful success. But if you were to ever look at her resume, wholesale coffee and tech don't go hand in hand at all, but it worked. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I did t-shirts and hats in college and ski trips. So <laughs> I guess it worked out okay. Uh, and then what are, and you also mentioned attribute in terms of creative. So how would you identify somebody on the creative side? And that's when you just go to those good old fashioned open-ended questions and uh, around like, you know, walk me through a time when something in your life happened. And when you're thinking about these questions to ask, you're saying, these are the three questions I'm going to ask to determine if they check the box for strategic thinking, creativity, uh, being curious. What I'd also encourage is to keep those questions consistent um, across your interview, because then you're going to be able to create more of a baseline to say, okay, what does a good answer sound like? Even though they'll be very, they'll come from very different points of view. Yeah. And I guess, you know, again, depending upon the background, we think about, you know, jobs, even somebody that, you know, was a waiter, waitress, you know, where you know, a lot of times they get you know paid a, b a bonus if they sell whatever is the special item of the day. You know, I mean, those types of people that, you know, also shows, you know, a lot of hustle and a lot of initiative. 
you know, and again, I'm, I'm old school, so not that there's anything wrong with academics, but I was early on at EMC and <laughs> no offense to Ivy League education, but it's like we're, you know, if we interviewed somebody who was from the Ivy League, it would be kind of almost more like a negative, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, as opposed to somebody that was more kind of blue collar, scrappy, um, again, bad to do a broad stereotype, but, you know, kind of just you know, pe- peeling back the onion on, you know, really is, you know, what is that persona? You know, what, what is that profile? Absolutely. I might be getting myself um, in trouble here a lot in this one, but anyway. <laughs> no, no. And, and, you know, and, I, and I've definitely worked at companies early on in my career who had very like high standards where you, know, they, you must be from Ivy or public Ivy. Um, you must have this, you must have that. And I just don't think those standards apply anymore. I yeah. think you can do a whole lot better. Um, you know, I, I've worked with folks who actually don't have college degrees. 